yet uh, several schools, Pratt here in New York and Rhode Island School of Design, have illustration courses. I don't know what they're for because you can't get jobs. I once talked to RISD at their invitation. I showed him my stuff, and the first question was, how do I get a job in illustration? I said, how the hell do I know? It's, it's, it's gone. They hated me. They didn't ask me back. <laughs> Born and raised in Simcoe, Ontario, Bruce McCall had a fascination with the United States and particularly New York City from a very early age. After working in advertising, he ended up with a job in his dream city as one of the original members of National Lampoon and then found work as an illustrator and writer for his holy grail of journalism, The New Yorker Magazine, where he's done illustrations for dozens of covers. We met up with him in his adopted hometown of New York City. Bruce, i got to tell you, when I started reading your book, <clears throat> At the very beginning, before I really got into it, I thought, man, you know, he, the, Simcoe must have been the place to, to, to grow up. It was like I was reading about Mayberry. That's right. And then, I insist and then it all took a turn. turn. <laughs> yes, I, I insist on preserving that memory of this <laughs> idyllic Norman Rockwell, yeah. the Canadian version of Norman Rockwell life. That's right. It was a very safe haven for me, a cradle. For a while, at least. Well, for the first 12 years of my life. Yeah. I've yeah. uh, been there for 150 years, so <laughs> very, com very comfortable. But it was <clears throat> your, f and, and again, as I say, you know, that, that was the image I had. Like, like I, I was waiting for Opie to show up, or maybe you were Opie in this whole thing. And then, and then you start talking about your family, and then you start talking about your parents, and then it all, it all kind yeah. of went south. Yeah, that's right. right, right. Your, uh, your, your family life back then was, um, I don't know, I guess unusual is not the right word, but it certainly was, it, it wasn't Mayberry, was it? No, it wasn't. It wasn't. No. Although at the time, I didn't notice that when I was growing up in Simcoe. Until we moved to Toronto, I, I thought everything was fine. My father was away all the time, which gave us a great deal of freedom, as you can imagine. So it was not a normal family life, just not having a father. I thought that's the way life was. I didn't yeah. even, you know, and so when that happened, when he came home, he didn't want to come home. He didn't want to have six kids running around. So when that happened, things got tense. He was away. He was on the road almost all the time. It seemed. He was in the Air Force. He had six kids, and he volunteered to be in the Air Force, went overseas for... Three years, I guess it was in the RCAF. Yeah. And when he came home, he wasn't a pleasant man. No, he'd had a nervous breakdown because he was a PR guy for the Air Force. We had to interview these wonderful young 19-year-old guys who flew off to their deaths in, in the uh, RCAF. So he, he just he had so many. His best, best friend was one of them, and he just couldn't take it. And he yeah. had to be reshipped home. Yeah. And your mother was uh, not motherly, shall we say? She withdrew into herself, didn't yeah, she? Yes, she did. Helped by boo booze, of course. Yeah. That yeah. was very much part of her tragedy. Was she got into? She was lonely. She had you know a small woman with six kids and no money and a small town which she hated, and her father, her husband away for years at a time. So not much of a life. Yeah. Your fascination with uh, this country that we're sitting in now, the United States, started pretty early though. It started in Simcoe, didn't it? Yes, it did. On the desk of my dentist, Dr. Seiler, they had a Bakelite model of the Empire State Building, and I thought there's no Empire State Building in Canada. That stayed with me the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and that sort of started it, I think. Yeah. yeah. Tell me about your brothers and sisters. It's interesting because at the end of your book, you talk about, you know, how you, most of you are still in touch and so on. But, but then there was one line that struck me. He said, but still, if you could fit all six of us into a phone booth, we'd find a way not to touch each other. Yes, the Calvinist uh, <laughs> tradition, the, the Presbyterian Canadian uh, refusal to actually be intimate. Yeah. Yes, that was true. And you were, you've were you described yourself out of all six kids as the moody one. Yes, I was most like my father, actually. Is that right? How ironic. I was his worst critic. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Tell me about the relationship with your, with your old man. Did, I mean, did, did you get along at all? Were there times when you got along at all? Once. He took me to Detroit to see a ball game. That was 1950. That's the only time I ever went away with him, every time I spent any time with him alone. When you're six kids in a family, it's hard to get quality time with the painter familias. Uh, but no, otherwise, he was not, He was very brusque. He was very uninterested in us kids. He didn't know what grade I was in or any of us. He didn't really care. Uh, he despised the fact that I liked to sit in my room and draw. Yeah. He wanted me to go out and play ball. He was a, a real jock, and he thought I was a disappointment that way. And among you made, many others. You made the attempt, though. I made the attempt. Made we the all attempt. made the attempt, but we were rebuffed. Yeah. Well, you made the, I mean, you tried to play hockey. Yeah, I played hockey. Boy, yeah. your description Everybody of trying to play hockey, hockey sounded like <laughs> it was like my attempts to try and play hockey when I was a kid. I loved it, though. It was just, yeah. You know, it was just, yeah, I still love hockey. Yeah, that's right. You're a Rangers fan, aren't yes, you? Yes, yes. Which is a dangerous thing to be in Toronto when I was a kid. Uh, yes, yeah. absolutely. Probably still is, but... Probably. Yeah. Right. Um, tell me about the drawing. When did it start? 
as, as early as I can remember anything, I remember drawing. I, I didn't do it for anything but self-pleasure. I just, you know, it's like a form of onanism, I suppose. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was started out being just a hobby, just something I did instinctively. And my father, being a writer, there was always a, t a typewriter around the house. So I'd alternate between typing, which is magic, seeing your words in cold type. God, that was wonderful. And I just drew and drew and drew my entertainment and just kept doing it. And then when things got really bad, it was an escape. It was a psychic escape to go to my room and draw these fantasies, which took me away from where I was, gave me all the power. Yeah. It's a wonderful feeling. It's why people like to be cartoonists and artists, I think. Yeah. Um, you, you actually wrote to Norman Rockwell and got a reply, didn't yes, you? Yes, yes, very sweet, 1946. What, yeah, so... He was my, we had the Saturday Evening Post every week in the right. house, you know, and he was the hero. He was the star of the... In those days, illustrators were, were heroes. They were really highly paid celebrities. Yeah. And he was the top of the heap. He was great. And I loved his stuff. So I sent him my pathetic little wad of drawings, and he kindly said, very good, keep it up. Well, it was very nice of him to bother replying. But that must have been something oh, to yeah. get that letter. I still have the letter. You, you still have it? Yeah, yeah, of course. I would think. Yeah. It's probably worth some money these days, I would think. Mm -hmm. Easy. Yeah. Or maybe not. I gave a talk at the Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge based on that letter. You know? <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> It's funny, you know, when you talk about illustrators, and you think now, uh, if you were to talk to young people today, I don't think they would know what an illustrator That's true. was. That's true. Yet, yet uh, several schools, Pratt here in New York and Rhode Island School of Design, have illustration courses. I don't know what they're for, because you can't get jobs. I once talked to RISD at their invitation. I showed him my stuff, and the, well, the first question was, how do I get a job in illustration? I said, how the hell do I know? I, it's, it's, <laughs> it's gone. Yeah. They hated me. It didn't ask me back. <laughs> That's the cold hard truth, though. Yes, it is. Sadly. Yes, it is. So tell me, so you made the, you, you get out of Simcoe, the, the whole family moved to Toronto, and, and things were grim in Toronto. Yes, because we were in a big house in Simcoe. We were stuck in a little apartment. Uh, Central Mortgage and Housing Corporation, which is a government body, gave apartment preferences in that housing shortage time to veterans. And so everybody in that little block at 2337 Danforth was in the service. But they're all with two kids. We had six kids in three bedrooms piled on top of each other. It was claustrophobic. It was tiny. That tension, the physical tension of that, you know, it's like a rat's in a maze. And then you had my mother who was drunk and my father who refused to recognize it when he was home. That leads to a certain tension and certain psychic disturbances. Yeah. And we were all, you know, kind of suffered from it. Yeah. How did it affect you? What was the, what was the manifestation of your suffering under all that? Depression, I think. Yeah. Uh, we all had a certain degree of it. I had depression. I did wasn't treated, of course, because depression in those days in Canada wasn't recognized. You know, didn't go to didn't go to shrinks. That was no drugs, nothing like that. Yeah, I, I I was a wonderful student in school. I loved learning. When I got to Toronto high schools. I failed three times out of four years. I was a hopeless student. That was because I wasn't able to function. That's yeah, really, really bad. Yeah. You you write. There's a, a a short chapter in the book about your fascination with Charles Dickens. Yes. Uh, talk a little bit about that. And, and first of all, I have to tell you, because the chapter is, is titled Boz, B-O-Z. Yeah. And, uh, and Rob Walsh, our camera guy over here, and I were, I mentioned this to him because the only Boz that we know is Boz Skaggs. Was that Charles Dickens' like that was a his, nickname or yes, something? Yes, that was his nickname. I never yes, knew that. Yes, like Gadge Kazan. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Boz was so you, you, how, why is it you identified so much with Dickens? I had him at the right time of my life. I was, I was a teenage writhing with emotion that I couldn't express. I was dramatic in the sense I, I love the idea of romance and adventure and stuff. Here comes this guy who's so sympathetic to the human condition. He's an under underperformer himself. He started out poor. I identify with that. His struggle alone to become something in the world. He was so romantic and sentimental and powerful in his depictions of things. He just, I just identified with that. Just, he was the first writer I seriously read. I yeah. also had, if I read James, Henry James, maybe I would have been a great Henry James fan. I don't know. <laughs> But it had a shelf life, though, your fascination with Dickens. Yeah, I tried to read him again a while ago, and it didn't work. Doesn't, yeah, I don't know it's over time. Never go back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, you end up, now, I, I, we're going to skip forward, but one of the passages in the book that I found so funny was when you and, and, and a buddy of yours decide that you're going to start your own uh, car <laughs> magazine yes, to compete with, <laughs> what was the one that was, that was existing? It was... Canada Track and Traffic. Track and Traffic. Yeah. Called Trash okay. and Tragic by many detractors. <laughs> and you were going to be you were going to be competing with them. Put them out of business in a, in a there week. There you go. Yeah. 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 The Canadian Driver, your magazine right. was going to be called. We were car nuts. We were absolute car nuts. No sense of reality. Canada <laughs> didn't need a car magazine. Yeah. There were very good ones in the U.S. You could buy on the newsstands. 
We just wanted to do something about cars. But it sounded like you, the two of you, were just completely living in a dream world. Like you, we had a plan where we would make a profit the second month. We had no money to start. We borrowed money from some poor dope. Who, the other guy was the finance guy. I was the editor, and he raised money in the most, you know, dark alley way. <laughs> and you know, it lasted. It didn't even get on the newsstand until right before it died. It was very <laughs> sad. But then the next day, I got a call. I became editor of Track and Traffic. Yes, there, and you, yeah. and you discovered the glamour of that job. Yeah, pretty yeah, quick. Right, yeah, right, right. Yeah, on the, above the Wheat Chief Restaurant Cafe on uh, Bathurst and King, the in oldest Toronto. tavern in, in yeah, the oldest, yeah, yeah. I thought it was wonderful. Yeah. I never went in the place. Actually, I was a very good boy. Really? Yeah. Wow. No libations. But it turns out that that magazine was pretty much <laughs> maybe a notch, maybe a notch above what you guys were trying to pull off to begin with. Anyway, yes, it was a shoestring operation to say the best. Yes. Yeah. As was, you said, if there was a shoestring, it was a shoestring. Yeah, right. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a good experience for me because it taught me an awful lot about journalism and writing and yeah. stuff. Well, you, you got, I mean, it was, in a way, fortuitous because you ended up going, what was the thing called? Was it the Shell 4000? Is that what it was called? Sure, it was a rally, yes. Yeah, it was a rally. Yes, across Canada. And you, so, and you, had to, you were assigned to cover it. Yes, twice. So, so to speak. Yes, yes, yes. And that was where, you know, as you said, I think you say in the book, if there was a sign saying, Change direction or whatever it was. Yes, that that's right. That was the great moment. Of you met a guy. Life. I met a guy, David E. Davis, who was the advertising copywriter at Chevrolet in Detroit, at the agency there, on sports cars, Corvette, and so on. And he and I got to be chums, hanging around races, at first at the rally, but then afterward at car races in Ontario. And uh, he said, "Why don't you come to Detroit and work in the advertising business?" I said, "Me? I, I'm a little Canadian. I couldn't do that." But I thought about it. it. Took me about two minutes to say yes. <laughs> Double my income. Everything worked out just like I thought it would be. It was wonderful. Now, see, that's uh, I'm, as I'm reading that the, the company was was Campbell Campbell Ewald Ewald. So there's an advertising agency in Detroit, and it's dealing with with Chevy. Chevy basically. had a whole Chevy account. Yeah, which is interesting because anybody who's watching the series Mad Men is watching them trying to get the Chevy account. And I'm thinking, as I'm reading your book, I'm going, "Whoa, this is they're in Detroit for one thing, not in New York." I just wrote a piece about that for the New Yorker. <laughs> Did you? Yeah. Well, there you go. Very interesting. But what, so, what was that like when you got there? I mean, you you to you it was like going to Detroit. It was like going to yes. you know the oh my god, Avalon. General Motors building on, on West Grand Boulevard in Detroit was a cathedral, a big marble temple to General Motors' power and wealth and influence. And it was just, just like the Vatican. You walk into that place, and they had New York newspapers at the newsstand, you know, and, and three elevators and carpeted. God, it was like <laughs> like the little boy being brought to the palace. The thing that I thought was most intriguing was that they you got hired based on his word. Yes. It wasn't like you had to audition or no. and give them a portfolio. Well, let me tell you, the talent level wasn't that high. <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was a pretty low threshold, actually. They had to churn out new fire, new flair, new freedom from care. It was it was just cornball advertising, really. And the chairman of the of the agency never even set foot in the creative department. The creative people weren't even allowed to see the new cars when they came out. We were non persons. That was the way Detroit ran in those days. Creativity was. So wait a minute, you're writing copy for cars that you haven't seen. Yeah, next year's cars. We never allowed to see them. The account guys, the business side, oh, they were allowed to see them, but not us. <laughs> well, where's the logic in that? We're just underclass. We're just writers were scum. It's like Hollywood, you know. The writers don't <laughs> count. It's just not important. Wow. So how long did you do that? Two years. Two years, and then went where? New York. Okay. I was infected with New York fever. I was then a serious ad man for that time in my life because New York was where all the hap ha things were happening. The Doyle Day Birnbach with the Beatle advertising, you know, glamour, all that stuff. Detroit was a wasteland, and uh, so I connived to get myself into New York just to get out of Detroit. Yeah. And what was the first gig you got here? J. Walter Thompson on Ford, which is a real boiler room. No fun at all. But I only lasted there six months, thank God. It was awful. <laughs> so Did they fire you? No, no. I got a job at Ogilvy and Mather, the Anglican Church of Advertising. <laughs> um, uh, Mercedes-Benz had just started an American company, and they needed an uh, agency. And Ogilvy won it because they had had Rolls-Royce, and they spoke in that elevated way. And I was able to imitate that style, so I got hired. What year would this have been? 60, 66. 66. So you stuck that out for a while, did you not? Yeah, I stayed stayed with Ogilvy for quite a while. I went to Germany you know, for three years, working on Mercedes there, and came back. And by that time, I'd kind of kind of suspect advertising was not my favorite thing to do in the world, but it was very lucrative, very well-paying. I'm sure. It's a meritocracy. It's one of the good things about advertising. One of the few good things about advertising is that 
you don't have to have a college degree. I was a high school dropout, so that was the only way I could make any real money was in the brothel yeah. of advertising. <laughs> and uh, so, I, but I started tired of it. It's shallow life, you know. You're you're pounding the drum for some product all the time. You don't really believe it. And, uh, so, what kind of product was it? All cars? Or was well, it was a mix of things. Yeah. After a while, I couldn't just do cars. I had to justify my salary with other things. Toro lawn mowers. Okay. Sort of a vehicle. <laughs> yeah, yeah right, right. not the same class as Mercedes Benz. No. Now, you see, I first became aware of you. I have to say, and and this, I think, I share with with uh, Robert Fulford because I think he wrote about this. Ah, once. yes. I became aware of you in National Lampoon. Yeah. The, the 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 shame of the North. I think it was called. Bob Fulford went to Malvern Collegiate, where I went to, and he quit too. There you go. Uh, so, it's, <laughs> so maybe it wasn't you. Maybe it was the school. Yeah. <laughs> But the shame of the North was, I remember oh, reading yeah. that. Well, I was a big Nash. I was in university at the time, 19, 1970, I think it was, 70, yeah. 71, somewhere in there. Yeah. Or I was just leaving. I was, le I was just dropping out of university, in fact. And maybe you were responsible. Yeah. Um, and I remember seeing that, that piece. And it was, a, it was a great parody of... Life in a Canadian border town, yes. <laughs> a Canadian border yeah. town. Yeah. For Hatless dancing. <laughs> <laughs> All vanilla flavors ice cream. <laughs> Eskimo kissing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about the uh, your connection to National Lampoon. How did that, that was that was uh, the entry to professional life for me. I, I had been in Germany. I came back, and someone told me, incidentally, that there was this new magazine called National Lampoon. I said, "You mean the Harvard Lampoon?" No, no, this is a this is a newsstand commercial magazine. And I looked at it. and I thought, "These are my people. This is just, this is just stuff I've always done, and never nobody, I didn't think anybody else would ever get it." They're very erudite. They're all Harvard brats, you know, smart, fast, ambitious, and. Uh, so I went up there to see them, and it was a love at first sight. I just I showed him my pathetic little portfolio, and he said, "Come on aboard and do thirty pages a year, and anything you want." So that was my beginning. Anything you want. Yeah, I didn't never I never had to work in the offices, which were a cesspool of rivalries, jealousy, sexual, oh, horrible things. <laughs> Everybody was. Hated it sounds everybody. like every newsroom everywhere. Yeah, I guess frankly. so. Yeah, and, 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 you even more experience than that than me. But uh, <laughs> dipping into that was it's better not to be there. I was yeah. always close, but not in the not in the house. Have you have you managed to pretty much maintain that kind of relationship throughout your professional life, not ever having to actually be there? Yes, that's right. That's right. I like working by myself. Yeah, I'm not a good. I don't play well with others ever. And you don't need a collaborator if you have any ideas. Why do you need somebody to lean on? You just get in the way. They just slow things down. Yeah. A few times I've tried it, it's not been good. You know, it's interesting because what you excel at is such a strange amalgam, well, not strange, but but unique amalgam of of writing and and art and uh, and that that wry humor attached to both that I think maybe a long time ago, decades ago, might have been more commonplace than even when you started doing it in the, in the 60s and 70s, and certainly even now. There aren't many people who practice that. No, I wonder why that is. I don't understand. One of the reasons is in school, there's a fork in the road. Academic leads to writing, and art school leads to art. Mm -hmm. And you never combine the two. And so I, when I was a kid, I was bouncing back and forth. Should I be a writer? Should I be an artist? Should I go that way? Should I go to Malvern? Should I go to Danforth Tech, which was the art school? I, I shuttled back and forth. And the Chinese have an expression, man who's chased rat, two rabbits never catch any. And I thought, in a way, if I keep doing both of them, I'm never going to get anywhere. So I concentrated on art first. It was a tremendous failure in commercial art. Then I tried writing. It was much better. Yeah. The, is, when did the New Yorker gig come along? Well, I've been an admirer of the New Yorker since 11 years old. I found this pile of New Yorkers in a closet in our house. My parents were disappointed jazz babies who never had any money, never could travel. They wanted to be sophisticated. They read books. They really spent their honeymoon in New York. And they treasured these old New Yorkers, which were a sort of beacon of civilization and sophistication. And they stuffed them all away in the closet. And I found them one day. And immediately noticed there's something about the sensibility of that thing that I really liked. It was smart ass, it was satirical, not all of it, but yeah. yeah. I, I, and I didn't just read the cartoons, I also read the text. And that, that fixed me for the rest of I, that. That sensibility was what I wanted to be. It told me what I wanted to do, to be a satirist. And I kept that in my mind and my heart for many years. I, did, I was a high school dropout, I was Canadian, I was diffident as hell, even for a Canadian. So I didn't dare, they wouldn't take me. I mean, they, they, they took Nabokov's letter of uh, writing and changed it. How would they possibly <laughs> Yes, I know. Be? Who were these guys? Yeah, who, yeah. I, was, I didn't, wasn't fit to walk that red carpet. Come on. So I waited and waited and waited for years until I was in my early 40s before I even submitted something. And of course, the first time I submitted something, they bought it and said, where you been? We're waiting for you to come. Wasted 20 years of my 40s. Yeah. 
Was that the reaction you got? It was literally yeah. like that? They yeah. were... Yeah, I had no idea. I had no idea. I was afraid to even talk to them, you know? Yeah, yeah. Do you remember what it was you submitted? It was a little little piece. It was a piece of captions without the pictures. It was just <laughs> silly little captions of pieces of art done in a precious art gallery style. I don't remember what it was funny about, what it was funny about it, but it, they, they, it was one page, you know. Wow. My, I couldn't have been more modest, more timid, more circumscribed in my humor. I was terrified they wouldn't buy it. So, so they <clears throat> so they say, where have you been? And suddenly you have this relationship that's going to last for decades. It yes. goes on to, to this very day. Yes, yes. But, but somehow you managed to be able to sort it all as different as, as you were so that you don't have to be in a newsroom yeah, eight well, hours a day, five I, days a week. I just kept doing what I've always done. And, and there's really no line I crossed where I changed what I did. You know, so that, That's the best thing about my life. I do exactly what I want to do, and I'd be doing it if I weren't paid for it. I wasn't paid for it for many years. I just did it for fun, for friends. Right. And then suddenly somebody would pay me for it. But I didn't change to follow the crowd. I didn't follow commercial trends. I just do what I do, right, even today. It's just it's wonderful. Now, that would be, you know, I would think that you'd have young people who would like to follow in your footsteps to a degree saying things to you like, well, how, does, how, does, how do you get to be you? And there really isn't any answers. No answer. It's all, it's all just happenstance and being in the right place at the right time. Or I'm the worst teacher in the world. I don't know what I'm doing myself. I'm not going to tell anybody else. I just make it up as I go along. I have no philosophy. I have no great theories. I don't know anything about it. I never went to art school. I don't, all that stuff doesn't mean anything. I didn't, didn't go to university. I don't know anything about writing except what I like. Yeah. Tell me about the art part of it then. Do you have a studio in your in your home? Yes. And so how often do you, is it like a muscle that you have to exercise every day like writing is? Do you do no. that sort of stuff? No, it's funny. I'll tell you a story about that. I stopped uh, art altogether when I quit commercial art or was asked to leave. Mm. And I turned to writing. And I wrote for 10 years. And I was in Germany. And then I, I'd been in the hospital. And a friend of mine and I traded these funny cartoons about World War II airplanes. And... Finally, he said, I got a friend of Playboy. He's gonna, he wants to buy this piece. You do the illustrations, I'll do the text. I said, I hadn't painted in 10 years. I was forced to do it for the lure of Playboy magazine, big money. And uh, I sat down, and I, I hadn't touched a brush in 10 years, and I picked up just where I left off. It was better, actually. It's better than I was then. It's amazing. It, didn't, it doesn't go away. It's like riding a bicycle. I just, I, I was, my muscular control was a little weak, but I got back to that real fast. I couldn't believe it. But you, and you've never actually had any formal training in no. art, have you? No. So it was all just from you starting as a kid? And Slavish imitation of the great popular illustrators like Rockwell and yeah. Stephen DeHattis, yeah. those guys. Those when magazines. you were young, did you do the, the, the tracing paper thing? Yeah. Tracing's underrated. It's a way to learn how to draw. Yeah. And you, you follow great skilled art, you learn something about it. Yeah. So um, tell me about the relationship with the people at The New Yorker over the years. I mean, you, you've done so much stuff for them, and... Do they... Well, tell me exactly how um, a cover or anything that you do for them comes about? Is it your suggestion, their suggestion? Will they call you up and say, how's this for an idea? Can you do something with this? Or they, never, they never do that. They, no? never ask, they never tell me ideas, never. They huh. just say, we have a, you know, what's, Easter's coming up or baseball season, big, broad subjects like that. Sometimes I do it, sometimes I don't. If I don't have an idea, I don't do it. 90% 90, 90 of the time, I just come to them with my own ideas. It's just purely, that's, that's something that's provoked by nothing systematic. It's just, right. I, I'm driving along and I have this image and I do it. It's, it's very unscientific. <laughs> very dangerous because you never know when you're going to stop having them, you know? Yes. Well, there's you hit always on that. the head by a baseball bat and I never have another idea. <laughs> do you have that fear sometimes that it's the, no. the well's going to run dry? No, it'll never run dry. I have no? too many ideas. No. Really? Eh? Not all of them good, but I have them. Okay, well. So do you, do you have, have to feel like you have to pay attention to what's extant in the culture? I think everybody does, don't you? You do. I mean, yeah. You're, it's you're in the by swim. Osmosis, you're, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, most, it's a good word for it because I don't, I don't make a study of it. That would make it too pompous, pretentious. I just know what's going on. Yeah. I miss a lot of stuff. There are guys who are fa faster than I am on the uptake. Andy Borowitz, who's a wonderful humorist for The New Yorker and a friend of mine, he is so good at taking yesterday's headline to make it into a piece today. He's just always on top of things. Things I, oh, I didn't have thought, should have thought of that. Yeah. Tell me, I got to get you, because we only got about four or five minutes left here, but I got to get you to tell me what you were telling me before we started the interview about writing a, an op ed piece for the Times that, about Canadian politics that was taken oh, seriously yes. I was, by I was some poor sap. I was called by a Montreal radio station a couple weeks ago after the piece ran. It was about the Trudeau making fun of the fact that Canada's never had a political dynasty. This could be a new dynasty. Trudeau, Justin Trudeau would take over his father. And, the various ramifications of that, all done in a very tug-in-cheek way. Very tug-in-cheek. 
because I'm not a political writer. And uh, this, this guy interviews me on the radio show. Bruce McCall is going to talk to us now about the Trudeau. And he asked really, what do you think of the Liberal Party's chances in the, ele the by-election in CARP? Or something? <laughs> Just he's crazy, not crazy, but he's highly uh, specialized. I, I said, I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't, I'm not the guy. You've got the wrong guy. Oh, well, we've been talking to Bruce McCall. Bye. No, it, but this, it doesn't make you despair in a way. It's, 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 yeah. like, it's like irony. Is, it's an irony-free yeah. zone, yeah, right? Yeah, right, right. Like <laughs> and he wouldn't pick debate. He wouldn't make fun of that. You know, he wouldn't make fun of the fact that he got the wrong guy. Right. That was the way to go, I thought. Yeah, he's just, that's it. So yeah. long. Yeah, he's not Big famous for his humor. I don't know who he is. But. <laughs> I thought that was priceless. So at the very end of your book, you talk about going back. And you went, back to, you went back to Simcoe, and you went back to the neighborhood in Toronto, and you went back to Windsor, where the family was as well. You went back to all these places. Why? Because I think you always want to go back and see if you can find something out by just being there and soaking up the same atmosphere. Maybe something will appear to you that didn't seem obvious before. I never quite understood what my life was about, and parts of it were very mysterious and sad, and maybe I could see better. It doesn't work. It's bullshit. It doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a waste of time. You went back and it was you just... You stare at the same old little ho the old, old homestead as long as you want, and nothing comes out of it except sad. It's gotten older and yeah. some of you yeah. was it given that up. It's, it, but I, you, might, you, were, you were expecting something, obviously. I mean, it would have been... I guess yeah. it would have been, for the purposes of the book, would have been a nice, a nice completion if you'd gone back and felt something about those places. And in fact... Yeah, I was at the Toronto Film Festival a couple of years ago, and an American friend of mine was with me. I said, come on. Uh, he, he'd seen the movie, They Made It Thin Ice. He read yes. the book. And he, I said, come on, I'll take you to my old neighborhood. So I did the neighborhood. After he finished, he said, thank you for the magical misery tour. <laughs> <laughs> my high school, my apartment building, this is the way I uh... And I have to say, too, that this just occurred to me as you were talking, the fact, I forgot about the film, but one of the things that, that certainly impressed me, and I'm, I must have made you feel pretty good, too, was that Steve Martin saying you were his god when he was trying to, when he was trying right, to have a right. He's a wonderful guy. I felt bad. I had to ask him to do that because the film guy didn't have any connections with him. And I said, could you just do five minutes? And uh, he said, okay. But he was anxious to get the hell out of there. So <laughs> <he'd be> <laughs> There's the, yeah, you're, you're certainly not a romantic, are you? No. no. I'll fix that. <laughs> so your deal with the New Yorker now is just, are you, are you a staff person? Are you on retainer? What's the deal that you've got with them? How's I don't know work? what they call me. They have a very, very few salaried people. They're, like everybody else, they don't right. want, they want you know, no health benefits, stuff like that. But I'm a contributor. There's a staff. Maybe there's an honor, honorary term called staff. I don't know what it means. I never bothered to check, actually. Yeah. And you'll just keep going for as long as they'll let you do it, I'm assuming. Right. I've been four editors already, so uh, maybe the next one will, won't want me. But four, You've been through four editors? Sean, Gottlieb, Tina Brown, and David Remick, yes. And has, has there been a noted change in what they expect from you when editors change? Has there been any tension or no, some better than the others? No, no. Tina was terrific, yeah. despite the press against her in a lot of places. She, she, was, she, she made me do the first cover. I never had guts to suggest doing covers. She said, do a cover. You, when she tells you to do something, you do it. And I've done like 60 covers since then. But uh, if she hadn't said that, I never would have. Well, this is, uh, I'm, I'm glad you gave us the time to do this and, and to come to a part of town that you wouldn't normally come to. Yeah. <laughs> New Yorkers are so weird, i got to tell you. Anyway, thanks. Thank you very much. It's been great. Thanks.